thank uh, everyone for coming and uh, to welcome you to this closing panel for the 113th annual meeting of the American Society of International Law. I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the president of the society. It's really a great pleasure to have you all here. This is the eighth year that the society has partnered with our friends in The Hague to bring leading figures from The Hague and around the world to ASIL's annual meeting. As such, on behalf of the society, I want to deeply thank our Dutch colleagues for their support and sponsorship of this session. And I, I'd like to particularly call out a few uh, institutions and individuals. The municipality of The Hague has been central to this, and I'm delighted that we have Hague Deputy Mayor Saskia Branes here uh, with us today. Uh, second, I'd like to thank the uh, Netherlands Embassy here in Washington, D.C., which has been instrumental in helping to organize the event. And third, I'd like to uh, thank the TMC Asser Institute, which was established in 1965 in The Hague. It's an inter-university institute for international law. And I think all would agree that today it's a renowned center of expertise in the fields of public international law, private international law, and European law. I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Ernst uh, Hirsch Berlin, who's the convener of today's panel. And as he's coming to the podium, I'll note that Dr. Berlin is a former Minister of Justice of the Netherlands and is currently the president of the TMC Asser Institute. Ernst, it's a great pleasure to have you here. The podium is yours. Thank you, dear president, uh, Madam Mayor, um, dear all fellow members of uh, the society and other uh, other colleagues uh, here in this uh, remarkable place to meet you again. Uh, just like in previous years, it was again a great pleasure uh, and privilege for us at the Asser Institute in The Hague to organize in close contact with uh, ASIL, especially our friend Mark Grest, and uh, the city of The Hague, uh, a round table for the closing plenary. With the selection of the topic and the speakers, we try to do justice to the general theme of the annual meeting and to research and teaching focus of the Assam Institute. In these years of growing international tensions and attempts to, to reverse the embrace of multilateralism in international relations, we continue to focus on trust through <coughs> international law. One of the reasons why, why we feel deeply connected with this society is that our name giver, Tobias Asser, and your co-founder and first president, Eliu Root, were partners and protagonists in the same movement of fostering peace through international law. Both of them contributed to the Dutch-American cooperation with respect to the Hague-based institutions established in and around the Peace Palace, where all our institute is also located. And for both of them, this mission in the international arena was a consequence of their understanding of what would serve their country best. You know, of course, that Eliu Root was also involved in domestic politics as a minister, as the Secretary of State, and in later years as a senator. Less well known is Asser's participation in the Dutch liberal reform movement of the late 19th century. Root and Asser shared the understanding that just relations inside their country and in international relations were linked to each other. This is as important today as it was in their times. They both received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1911 and 1912 for their contributions to the development of the international institutional order. Their vision on international relations as an instrument for peaceful development of their countries was, in the words of Marty Koskenjami's Groch's lecture last Wednesday, no doubt enchanting. But their vision and mission had also implicit limitations. The rights and interests 
of peoples in other parts of the world did not surface in their worldview. Inevitably, also these great minds were children of their time. Are we able? And do we really want to do better? International law as an instrument for development, the topic of this closing plenary, connects international law with the living conditions within nations and the sustainable development goals for their citizens. Here, the connections between international and internal justice will be scrutinized. It is with much pleasure that I now give the floor to my close colleague and at the board of the Asser Institute and the University of Amsterdam, Professor Janne Nijman, who will introduce the participants <laughs> of the round table. Thank you. Thank you, Ernst. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to moderate this morning's session on a very topical and important subject, international law and development, international law for development. And we do so at a time that, and I think we share that experience, we experience grave concerns about how poverty, inequality and social injustices accompany economic globalization. International law as an instrument for economic development has contributed to the lifting of millions of people out of poverty, and yet developments in international law, be it trade law, investment law, or even human rights, come with increasing inequality as well. As a recent book argues, international economic law also is also implicated in the construction of human misery. In other words, time to take on this topic here in this closing plenary. And we do so with a very distinguished panel. Um, unfortunately, uh, I have to um, excuse uh, Secretary General Irene Khan. She had to withdraw from uh, uh, the panel due to overriding obligations. But now I'm delighted to say that we have three excellent speakers with us here this morning who will be able to provide us with uh, a lot of different perspectives on the topic. So I'll start with introducing our speakers and I'll start with Mr. Knutsen on my right-hand side, Ulrich uh, Knutsen took up his duties as Deputy Secretary General in January 2019. His portfolio um, at the OECD includes the strategic direction uh, of OECD policy on science, technology and innovation. It includes trade and ag uh, um, agriculture as well as enterprise, SMEs, and regions and cities. Until the end of 2018, Mr. Knutsen was permanent Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark. And prior to this, he served as Sherpa and Chief Diplomatic Advisor to two Danish Prime Ministers on security policy, EU, and foreign affairs in the Prime Minister's office. Then I turn to Martijn Snoop, um, since September 1st, 2018, Martijn Snoop has been um, the new chairman of the Netherlands Authority for Consumers and Markets, ACM. And ACM is an independent government agency that may be compared with the US Federal Trade Commission. Um, until his appointment at ACM, he worked at the Brau Blackstone Westbrook a very big law firm, as you know, for 28 years, operating from both Amsterdam and Brussels. Mr. Snoop practiced international competition law, antitrust law. Very happy to have you here uh, at, in our midst. I conclude with introducing uh, Balakrishnan Rajagopal. And um, he is currently a professor of law and development and head of the International Development Group at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. He's also the founding director of the Program on Human Rights and Justice. He has a first law degree from India, an LLM from the American University, and an interdisciplinary SDG in international law and development from Harvard Law School. It's important also, I'd like to mention that, that um, 
Balakrishnan is recognized as a leading participant in the third world approaches to international law, so-called TWIL network of scholars. So it's a wonderful, rich uh, representation of um, perspectives, I find. I hope the multilateral dimension uh, will be brought out, uh, uh, the, the business and human rights, the, the, the city's problematic, the, comp anti -comp uh, the antitrust dimension, uh, the resistance uh, of the past decades um, to the, the movement uh, and the way we approached development also through international law. Um, I suggest we go through a structure that is also indicated in your program. So we'll deal with the past, present and future of international law as an instrument. And um, after this sort of dia chronicle discussion, we'll make sure to have enough time to bring in your questions and remarks, because that's why we were briefly discussing before we uh, started this panel, how the topic of international law and development fits well the closing of this wonderful annual meeting. I mean, there have been sessions on trade, there have been sessions even this morning on natural resources, on investment, on, on international economic institutions. Um, if we start with the past, I remember an excellent session on colonization and how colonization has actually uh, impacted international law and has impacted the development uh, of, of the countries and is still part uh, of international law. It's hard to get the imperial structures out of international law and the development of economies. So that's one episode or uh, in the past, I wanted to say, but it's not closed yet, this past. Um, we have, of course, the, the 1960s, where the law and development movement was very important, um, scrutinized uh, for transplanting, really, Western law into developing countries' legal systems. Um, and yet, uh, today, a lot of uh, uh, attempts are made to make sure the rule of law is developed around the world uh, to fight against corruption, to, to create legal security, law as an instrument of change rather than a reflection of change. Well, we've seen the rejections against that. I'm sure that will be discussed. 70s uh, in 80s in the in the 80s and 90s we've seen how IMF uh, World Bank been very active and influential um, also that has uh, has invited responses and resistance um, let's let's start with a reflection on on international law um, as an instrument uh, and its past and maybe I can start with you, Uri, to reflect on what we should learn from this past uh, in terms of positive aspects and negative ones. Thank you very much, uh, Janne. I, I, um, I reflected very much uh, upon the mail that you sent me uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, inviting me to take part in that, because there were two questions in there that where one would think that the answers would be very different, because you asked, Concern, considering the past, what has worked? And then you also asked, asked what, what, what are the sensitivities from the last couple of decades that we should bring into the present and the future? And ironically, I think the answer to both questions is really the same. What has worked? Globalization has certainly worked. But what is the biggest sensitivity of, of, of our time? That's also globalization. And I'll try to explain that. Um, seen from our perspective at the OECD, um, there is objectively no doubt that globalization has uh, yielded the greatest uh, increase in, in global prosperity in history, uh, really. It's helped to spread democracy, it's helped to spread human rights indirectly as well, and it's fostered also the diffusion of choice for, computer, for, for, for consumers around the world, of science, of medicine, of culture, of sports, art, and so on. Uh, this was perhaps especially true of the West in, in, if you look at the first half of the period we've been through since the Second World War, and now lately also China, Korea, Vietnam and so on, uh, countries that have really, really uh, benefited from taking part in, in globalization. And by the way, let's not forget, it's, it's also lifted perhaps almost a billion people mm -hmm. out of poverty over the last two or three decades. So that is a great achievement, of course. So, so why is globalization then also a sensitivity? 
Uh, I think we, um, we've seen over the last uh, couple of decades that there is a growing concern that the uh, benefits of globalization have not been evenly spread, perhaps especially in, in, in Western countries, where we, where we have seen over the last, uh, I would say, decade perhaps, an increase in nationalism, in populism, uh, certainly an increase in, in protectionist uh, sentiment. And maybe this is also a reflection upon the fact that globalization has perhaps not helped the middle class grow in Western countries. I think um, this is perhaps, uh, perhaps we haven't shed enough light on this, but if we look at the biggest country in the West, the US, and if we look at the perhaps five or six biggest countries in Europe, um, without perhaps uh, without perhaps overdoing this, uh, because there are different reasons, but all these five or six or seven countries are at the moment marred by perhaps the biggest societal divisions that they have seen since mm -hmm. the uh, end of the Second World War. In US, it's the question of whether you are pro-Trump or against Trump, a pretty divisive issue in this country. Look at what's happening in the UK at the moment. They have not been able to discuss any other political subject than whether or not they should be a member of the European Union, how they should leave it with, that, with or without an agreement. It's smart British politics for, 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 for three years now. In Germany, you have uh, very existential discussions over identity, over migration, over over uh, over the greening of the uh, economy. In, in Italy, you have uh, the division between populism, basically, and the old parties, but even within populism, that has now come to power. Hence, it's not so popular anymore. That's sometimes what happens to populism when it when it gains power, it loses popularity. But even the two parties in power are now also uh, steering in completely different directions. We could go on to Poland, the national or separatist movements in, in Spain, and of course the Chile Schon in, in Paris, where we uh, reside at the uh, OECD. I'm not saying that this is all a crisis of globalization, but I think it is a responsibility for, for, for all of us, especially us in the multilateral institutions, to reflect upon this. What has gone wrong? Why do we see these uh, divisions? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, when we reach uh, reception time at half past 12, we are perhaps a little bit closer to answering some of these uh, questions. It's, but it's also noteworthy that this, that this backlash, if you like, or backlash sentiment against uh, globalization is not what's characterizing the developing world. If you look to, to Asia, if you look to Africa, you do not see this uh, uprising, if you like, against the globalization, against free trade. This is a discussion and this is a backlash that's actually stemming from the West, the very countries that built these structures and benefited so heavily from them. Uh, over the last, well, basically uh, 70 years. I think that is perhaps the, the biggest irony of our time, that the countries in this world that have benefited the most from international law-based cooperation and international rules-based system that we're discussing today, they're also now the ones most eager uh, in taking part in, in, in destroying it. I am myself, and so is certainly the OECD, the institution I represent here, a very, very, very staunch believer in continued international cooperation in an international rules-based order. I cannot see an alternative. I cannot see how this uh, world is going to tackle uh, migration, urbanization, terrorism, um, and all the other big, big issues in front of us if we do not cooperate. That is uh, that is the, the simple uh, okay. premise and proposition for me. But we do need to discuss whether we, or if we have explained the benefits of globalization good enough and whether do we have distributed the benefits of globalization mm -hmm. enough. And I think that is perhaps uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, question um, that we need to, to, to address in order to save and perhaps reform the international rules-based system that has served us so well in the past and I hope will continue to serve us well in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. Martijn, may I follow up with you? Yes, uh, thank you very much and, and, and thank you very much for <coughs> inviting me here. Uh, maybe on a, on a personal note, I sometimes feel, you know, I don't know if you have that, that you're suddenly being invited into a meeting and that you're supposed to speak about something that you have absolutely no knowledge about. I was fortunate enough that I was like the past three days at a conference here held also in Washington DC with three and a half thousand antitrust lawyers. I felt extremely comfortable in that environment, but here I feel I'm the only one in the room that has little or no knowledge about international law. Despite having practiced international competition law for 28 years, I think the area of uh, international public law was, um, was largely outside, outside my, um, my area of, uh, of scope. Um, but what I thought would be interesting to share with you some of the ideas behind competition law and how competition law was is 
part of the thinking um, of many uh, governments and institutions uh, in, uh, in, 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 in helping development uh, around the world. And um, I won't go back to the kind of the origins of, of competition law and the early basics in the in the late 19th century and early 20th century but I think the international proliferation of uh, competition law really started after the first world world war after World War II um, the United States government uh, insisted uh, when um, uh, after uh, the World War in the Pacific, that uh, Japan and, and Korea uh, implemented a rigid uh, American style based uh, set of rules uh, reflecting uh, the US style view on competition in order to help to rebuild both uh, both countries that were uh, damaged uh, by the by the war. In Europe, a sort of similar movement occurred, although slightly different, because in different countries in Europe, there were already remnants or kind of early bodies of competition law, and it was not necessary to start a system from, from the ground. And that means that with the help of the, of the US government, um, competition law was implemented uh, or, or built on existi existing structures uh, in Europe. A big change in, in, in Europe took place when the European Community for Coal and Steel was erected, one a, a, a very important and basically the founding, the, the father agreement of the current European Union, um, where uh, coal and steel were put under a multinational uh, framework where competition law was the core principle. Because the idea was if companies are no longer they can no longer enter into cartels uh, for coal and steel. This will limit the chances of another war in Europe. Um, and the idea behind the competition law, in particular competition law, how it was in, implemented in, uh, in Europe, was that uh, competition law not only promotes consumer welfare, um, lower prices, higher quality, and more innovation, but also stimulates economic democracy. Uh, and economic democracy was an important and is still an important part of the competitional thinking in Europe and, and, and elsewhere. Based on that European Community Coal and Steel Treaty, uh, the, the, the economic treaty that followed that treaty and that covered all areas of, uh, of the economy, again, same principles about competition law were, were implemented there and this continued. Uh, when the accession agreements with Central and Eastern European countries after the fall of the war were implemented, the European um, the Union insisted on a strong and rigid uh, competition law system uh, in, these, in these countries prior to accession to the European Union and, and also in uh, agreements, trade agreements with third countries nowadays the European Commission insists on the implementation of a, a rigid and thorough competitional system. Competition law is not only a, a, um, um, a part of the international law development uh, stimulated by, uh, by the European Union, obviously also the United States government, Australia and Canada uh, and other countries play an important role in, in the proliferation of, of competition law. There are numerous international organizations who do the same. OECD has a very strong program helping countries uh, to further develop their competition regime. UNCTAD is, a, is, a, uh, is an important player in this area. And I think one of the um, most interesting and, and, and well-functioning bodies is the International Competition Network that was set up i think close to a decade ago maybe even even more and now over 90 countries around the world um are part of the international competition network where actual particular competition authorities around the world get together once a year uh, with several work, work group, working groups and regional working groups to uh, share experiences and practices and 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 learn from each from each other there's a there's a strong outreach by uh, by developed countries uh, to uh, to emerging uh, countries and countries with emerging uh, competition law regimes to help them set up 
um, this system for um, economic democracy. So this is the past and this is the, the good news. Um, uh, and, and maybe in the second round, um, uh, I'll, I, I, I'll have a chance to say what the flaws are of this system and, and what the, the, the possibilities are to, to change that and, and, and make it more could ready you, for you, the uh, nowadays problems. Could you hint at that already? I, can, I, I, uh, <laughs> few, I don't want to talk too you long. Introduced, <laughs> no, I understand, but you introduced the relevance of competition, yep. right? Uh, and and uh, antitrust law as an instrument uh, uh, for, for development. So maybe just briefly what you think went wrong yep. and, and we follow up. Yep. Uh, no, no, very good. The, the, the premise of, of competition law is, is that basically consumers are sufficiently empowered to exercise their economic uh, uh, democratic right, if I, if I can say so. And, and that consumers vote with their feet. So if they're not happy with the product or the service, they just go to another supplier. So if you have enough suppliers, ideally, you know, that you create competition and, and competition creates these favorable outcomes. But there are three problems with that premise. First of all, is that consumers can only walk if they have inf sufficient information. So, and in many markets, there is a significant information asymmetry. So if things have to be, you know, rules have to be made, uh, to uh, to correct that information asymmetry and make sure that at least consumers uh, um, have all the necessary information. Second problem is is that we've now found out, and and so over the past couple of decades, the the governments uh, made rules to give consumers all the information they need to make the right choice. Think about. Uh, your uh, general cognitions on uh, that, that are you know that, that you see in uh, in in a contract that you in a consumer contract that you enter into four or five pages that hardly everyone ever reads but the idea was well as long as you can read it uh, consumers are sufficiently empowered to uh, uh, to go away well th this was a this is sometimes good but in many cases transparency is just not enough and what Mark, what we notice, that what, what scholars notice, is that there is a lot of consumer inertia. So consumers, they they go, they are with a certain supplier. They buy their energy, their telecom, their whatever they they buy from a certain supplier, and have a tendency to stay with that supplier. And that inertia from uh, from consumers is being used by by suppliers. And and one of the reasons that is, is that consumers do not act rationally or do not always act rational as, as is the premise in, in, in competition law policy and in competition law. And, and now I think the, the biggest challenge for competition law authorities, um, like the one I represent, uh, but from competition law authorities around the world is how to, how to make and how to help consumers without disturbing the market. And that is an enormous difficult nut to crack. And this is amplified by, um, by modern technology because modern technology sufficiently empowers suppliers to, uh, uh, to use that consumer inertia and to extract more value out of the consumers than in a fully competitive market. Um, so that is something that we can we can talk about later. Great. Yeah. Yes, we'll definitely come back also to that aspect of new technologies and their impact later in the discussion. Um, first, would you like to uh, reflect also uh, a bit on on what what we can take from from the past, uh, uh, what what we should avoid, uh, what what to learn? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, I guess the conversation so far already kind of uh, raises uh, the question of whether what exactly we mean when we talk about development. Is it a particular historical experience that um, um, you know particular regions of the world went through at a particular historical moment and using uh, specific um, you know uh, forms of uh, you know, technologies and interventions and ideologies and so on, or are we uh, talking about development as a simply 
another word for talking about capitalism, in which case we can also be talking about globalization, for example. Uh, I'm going to put on the academic hat here on the panel and uh, say that at least in the academic fields uh, that I'm associated with, whether it's international law, law and development, or human rights, or development studies more broadly, uh, development has a particular meaning which is quite distinctive from uh, globalization or from um, uh, certainly from capitalism as a phenomenon in the last um, several uh, um, uh, decades. Um, uh, to kind of summarize in a nutshell what uh, the way I've actually approached this particular idea of development with its connection to colonialism, as you indicated in your opening remarks, and uh, with the particular set of aspirations and uh, political strategies pursued by developing countries. Um, uh, uh, in, to put it in a nutshell, at least the way I, I have approached this issue is that modern international law, the 20th century, with its focus on functionalism, pragmatism, institutions, global institutions, uh, economism and human rights was historically founded as a result of what scholars have called the development encounter uh, or encounter between the uh, an international law largely uh, uh, created uh, as a product of uh, you know um, uh, Western ideas and practices with uh, the aspirations and goals and political strategies emerging from the rest of the world as they became decolonized. In that sense, international law is more than simply, I want to say, an instrument of development, but rather resulted from the encounter with development. Uh, uh, I've argued this several in several ways in my work, uh, most particularly in my book, uh, International Law from Below. Um, the second thing I would say is that this modern international law can be seen most acutely in the politics of decolonization, specifically since the 1960s. Although there were some precursors to it historically, um, the historical precursors to development um, were both intellectual, for example, as in the work of scholars like Wilfred Jenks during the interwar years, calling for a what he called a, a social character uh, of international law. Uh, uh, they were institutional as in the formation of the ILO, and particularly in the experience of the Permanent Mandates Commission, which a lot of very interesting historical uh, scholarship has actually repositioned as a precursor to modern international institutions, such as the World Bank, for example. In fact, many people who work for the Permanent Mandates Commission began their careers as staff members of the World Bank uh, later on. Uh, and uh, it was also a political project um, the historical precursors to development, as one could see in the demand by Japan, you know, for racial equality of nations at Versailles. Um, but my larger point is that decolonization produced an impetus for transforming much of old international law in the 1960s, an ethos which was captured partly in the work of scholars like Wolfgang Friedman and other leading figures to argue for a what they call the law of cooperation. Um, and the, you know, as the title of his book implied, the changing structures of international law. During this historical moment, developing countries perceived international law as a barrier to development, not as a tool of development. Uh, therefore, they argued for transformation. The work of the first generation of 12 scholars, such as Mohammed Bajawi or R.P. Anand, were intended to push towards that goal, the push by developing countries to transform international law. Since decolonization did not fully materialize, as we know from the formal non-acceptance of you know, demands like new international economic order by Western states. Um, but nevertheless, their actual material success, vividly illustrated by the rise of BRICS, as well as uh, of what uh, UNDP called in its 2013 uh, report, the rise of the rest, uh, echoing, in fact, the title of a, a, a book written by my uh, colleague, the late uh, economist, Alice Amsden. Um, uh, 
they uh, came, uh, the success of these developing countries, whether they're BRICS or others, came, I want to say, partly by explicitly violating Western international law, including in areas like competition law, investment law, uh, intellectual property, doing things that the Western countries are demanding as part of their either bilateral or multilateral negotiations, as well as by strategically deploying international law spaces and techniques to bolster and en entrench their economic and social advancement, particularly in the use of international trade law and the WTO, where developing countries have been large users of the WTO. Thus, although international law was seen as a barrier to development by decolonizing states in the 60s, they have ended up selectively using it. Um, third uh, point I would make is that the class character of international law is revealed by the overinvestment in lawmaking with uh, what I would call as teeth in areas which matter for global capitalism, the ruling classes, and the underinvestment in lawmaking in areas which matter to what you could call as the subaltern classes. We see this in the creation of institutions with real teeth, such as, for example, the ICSID um, since the 1960s, but picking up speed since the 1970s with the meltdown of the global financial and banking sectors in the early 70s and the formation of the Basel Committee. The neoliberal turn in world politics since the 1980s, especially since the 1990s in a ramped up fashion, also sometimes repackaged as globalization, cemented this overinvestment in legal regimes, which helps to form a particular kind of international law, an international law which is created by and works only for the interest of a global class of elites. We see the creation of the WTO, a kind of a legal Frankenstein in the 1990s, the NAFTA with chapter 11 and so on. Compared to this, the international law regimes which protect human rights, the oceans or the commons, or the environment are, I want to say, mostly toothless. The lopsidedness in the character of international law today, as seen historically, has deeply affected and is affected by the very structure of the states which form the international system. To put it in a different way, states also exhibit a class character internally, divided between a globalitarian class and subaltern classes within their own states, whether in rich countries like the United States or in countries like Brazil or India. The intersection of the multiple crises in which we find ourselves today, primarily an ecological and a planetary crisis, a moral and a civilizational crisis, and a political and institutional crisis can be rooted in the class character of the states and the international legal order which they've created historically. So to me, these kind of to me are the basic reflections based on which I think we can then move on to the question of how can we build international law to be more responsive for development. Thank you. Thank you um, to, to all, all of you. And, and there's already uh, so much on the table, uh, development very much related to economic globalization with indeed also a, a backlash, but as you say, very much a concern for distribution and redistribution. Ulrich um, and Martijn showing uh, us uh, a model in which uh, there is a role for consumers, there is a role for economic citizens, uh, there is a role for markets. Um, uh, Balakrishnan, you're, you're um, bringing out uh, an important question, what do we mean with development? Uh, and I think what is the, uh, this is an important one, right? Are we talking about economic development, uh, human development? Uh, um, how, how, how does that work together? Uh, is there, are there tensions? Are we working with the right models of development? Um, and I think all of you in different ways have hinted at, at the model that is uh, prevalent at the moment. I mean, liberalization, privatization. Um, there are limits there and, and, and we witness them. So maybe also in view of the time, we can do a few things um, to make sure we open up the floor for Q&A. Um, I was thinking maybe reflect a little bit about the tensions also very personally you experience and say, okay, in the whole, 
I think we're doing a great job. There is economic development, but being confronted with, yeah, human lives, uh, human misery, uh, where things are difficult to cope with, maybe, and, and uh, we face in our lives. Um, and let's question also the model of development we work with. Um, shall I take the same order, Ulrich? Is that okay? That's fine. But, but before I try to address that, I'd like to take issue with something uh, Martin said. Uh, he uh, unfairly tried to grab the title as the least qualified uh, on this panel. I would just say that I come here to the uh, American Society of International Law even without a law degree. <laughs> uh, so, so I think that's really a trump card that you... you I, 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 I demand that title. I'm, I'm an economist, but, but, but on a more serious note, uh, you said that, that, that it is sometimes a problem to competition law that consumers are not rational as, as sort of preconditioned in, 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 in the learnings. This is actually also the case in economic theory uh, where I come from, that we also expect uh, agents to be rational and they prove not to be, and this is perhaps an underlying uh, problem with the whole uh, economic uh, regime and, and theory. Um, I don't know if we can if we can conclude from 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 that that even panelists are sometimes not entirely rational, uh, <laughs> but but maybe we should let the audience uh, um, be the judge of uh, of that. Um, fr from the from 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 the multilateral perspective, from the OECD perspective, um, I would say that that um, we need international rules, we need international regimes, and uh, and uh, I, I I think I might also want to take issue with some of what you said. On, 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 on the uh, lopsidedness of the international system. That I would agree on some of it, and I also stress that, that, that we have some distributional problems. Whether it is inherently lopsided, I'm, I'm, I'm less sure. If you look at the UN, if you look at the WTO, the Special and Differential Rules, there's certainly a case that a lot is being done for developing countries to be able to catch up. And if you look at the last couple of decades, it's not really the West who has uh, provided the growth to the world. It's, 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 it's the rise of the rest, as you rightly said. But, uh, but, but, but maybe we have a chance to discuss that in a, in a, in a second or a, or a third round. What we've been doing at the OECD mainly, of course, is that we have provided soft law instruments. We also have a little bit of hard law, but it's basically soft law instruments. We've done that in almost every single area of public life you can think of, be it, uh, you know, uh, environment, export credits, development aid, uh, also uh, in, uh, investment, in intellectual property rights, but also what you hinted at, what should guide private uh, uh, businesses, what should guide uh, multilateral, uh, multinational uh, enterprises. We've, we've done it on, on bribery, uh, and we've done it uh, through OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, some of it has been taken to the G20 uh, as well, the principles of, go of corporate govern governance as well. So this is, this is the way we try to contribute. Um, uh, and, and actually, when we work through the G20 increasingly, not as what was formerly sometimes dubbed as the rich man's club, but actually as an organization that's trying to reach out. The D in OECD actually stands for development. Yeah. And I think that's worth stressing when we have a conference here or, or a panel here on international law and development. And this was even, uh, even critical to the founding fathers uh, back in the 19... 1960, one of the reports that led to the creation of the OECD actually underlined that we should look after the least developed countries within the OECD as well as countries outside the OECD. So this is this is just to this is just to to underline that this is also very much uh, our focus. Um, and, and may I push mm -hmm. you a little bit on sure. that in terms of if if you refer, of course, to the guidelines, uh, uh, new new guidelines and update human rights very explicitly on board, you see there and probably in other uh, parts of your work that it's difficult, right? It's difficult to steer on economic development and at the same time think about uh, uh, the, the the position. It's not difficult to think about, but actually also see that it is assuring that it is actually uh, improving lives mm -hmm. uh, in the streets of the cities or or so that the human rights element is is uh, is is of course on board but could you say a little bit about that tension um 
The tension is certainly there. There's no denying that there is a that, 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 that there is a tension there. Uh, I don't know that the OECD perhaps is the is the first and foremost organization you would think of when it comes to human rights, but it's certainly uh, in our charter that the, the countries that are members of the OECD do not only have to live up to to uh, you know uh, market economy and, uh, and 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 global rules on on that, but also democracy and human rights are mentioned there. So it's 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 certain it's certainly in there. Um, and, and as we look to the future as well, some of the areas, I think, where we do the most promising work at the moment in the OECD is actually also to protecting the right of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the next generation. Uh, one is on, on, uh, on artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, which we're going to hear a lot more about over the mm -hmm. coming years. The Chinese are now the biggest investors in artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, followed by the US. The Europe is lacking behind, and then comes the rest. Um, we have been trying to develop a set of principles for how you go about artificial intelligence that we hope will be approved uh, at, at our next ministerial at the OCD, but we would also like to take it to the D20 at mm -hmm. one point in order to make sure that, that this world does not, you know, die, you do, does not veer in, in five or four different directions when it comes to the use of the internet, the use of artificial intelligence, blockchains, internet of things, so on. Mm -hmm. Because there are tendencies already yeah. now that this is uh, happening. That's one set of contributions. And the other one, and I'll stop there, is uh, what is perhaps the most economically and politically charged work at the moment in the OECD, our work on digital tax, where there is, of course, a fear that uh, the, the, the tax base uh, in, in all the world's countries uh, is eroding now because big tech giants seem to be able to evade tax uh, by, by, mm -hmm. by, you know, uh, shifting their base if, if they like. And I think there is uh, agreement uh, among uh, most OECD members and non-members that this is a problem we have to solve because if, if countries lose their tax bases, uh, I mean, we have a whole different uh, problem uh, uh, Martin and, 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 and Balakrishnan on distribution of the benefits of globalization, because if we're not able to tax uh, sort of the profits from globalization and, and, and these uh, companies, I'm not, up, I'm not saying here exactly how we should do it, but if we lose that tax base, mm. uh, it'll become obsolete to talk about protecting human rights, protecting yeah. the vulnerable in the future. Yeah. No, of course, and, and and maybe we can indeed return to to that the importance of uh, of taxing in this in this issue. No, I was also and, and I was also thank you for for commenting on that uh, soft law role that you have, and in those standards you really see uh, human rights being being taken on board. Martin, may I follow up with you uh, in the on that tension uh, between human development potential tension human development and uh, economic development and also maybe reflect a little bit very, uh, critically on the, the the model of development that that is behind maybe uh, um, the, the the policies the structure really um, yeah 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 thank Great. you yeah m m maybe also just by way of background a little bit f my uh, on a on a personal note is that uh, like Leon, you said and explained to the audience that I was in private practice for 28 years, uh, representing mostly, if not exclusively, multinational firms, uh, the, the firms that Ulrich was referring to, uh, that are finding, uh, trying to find uh, good tax structures, optimal tax structures. And, and to be honest, I felt over the years increasingly uncomfortable. Uh, and the reason why I felt uncomfortable was that uh, these uh, large companies are very powerful. Uh, they have a lot of money to spend uh, that they use uh, uh, not only on lawyers, but also on public affairs consultants and, 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 and uh, industry experts and, and knowledge. And, and I thought, uh, and maybe for some in the audience, uh, they think, well, you know, it took you quite a while, 28 years, to, uh, <laughs> to change to, to change sides. But uh, nevertheless, I ch I changed after 28 years, and I and I thought um, that uh, that I I needed to support the other side. And the reason why I did is that I saw this inequality in what I would call the kind of the battle of legal arms. And um, just by way of background, competition or parts of competition law are, are sort of a have a quasi or a truly criminal nature. Uh, and that means that companies that are accused of competitional violations have the full body of human rights. Uh, so I also said I was a defender of human rights 
for big companies. Uh, and, um, and, 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 but it shows and, and how big companies use these rights, these human rights as, as legal entities being accused of, of economic crimes, also to slow down the process uh, and, and to exercise these rights to the maximum possible. And that made it an, a, to a, an, 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 an unequal battle. Uh, so that's that was on the one side, and the other side that really motivated me to um, to join uh, the government, and in particular the independent agency that I represent, uh, was that this agency, and it was ultimately the Dutch government that 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 of course that that decided that uh, this agency is a combination of consumer protection and competition law, and and I strongly believe that both need to go hand in hand because of the problem that consumers do not act always rationally, like panel members. Um, and that com consumer protection and, 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 and laws need to be implemented and enforced that protect consumers also against themselves. I'll give you an example. There are, and I'm not you know, bashing on the, on the big tech companies, but um, just let them mention, uh, there are, they, you know, there are these big, tech companies and they have fantastic products for free. At least they appear to be for free, but you pay with your privacy. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, and it's easy, like all of us and uh, myself included, you know, how often do we give up our privacy rights just to be able to use these free products, these free fantastic products for browsing, social networking, entertainment. And, and I believe that, you know, that, that in order uh, for competition law, for uh, economic freedom, uh, really to generate the results that it promises, consumers need to be protected against themselves, for example, by strict privacy laws. Other example is that uh, companies, online sellers of services and products, particularly the, the big ones, they have, they, they, they are in your brain more than you think. They, they know all the psychological processes to make you buy a product or a service. And uh, what they constantly do is a process which is called A-B testing. So they have, uh, they have a huge set of consumers, some, some companies, millions and millions of consumers, potential consumers, and they show them two versions of the website. You know, that, for example, one with a green button and one with a red one. And then they test and they see you know, what conversion rate in, in terms of how often will you buy a certain, or will consumers buy a certain product? And when they find out that, that consumers buy more products with a green button than with a red, they use the green button. Well, that's, of course, that's a fairly uh, innocent example. But um, they, they, they also use more sophisticated models. Like, for example, some of you have may, may have purchased a product which, you know, where, or a service which on your screen shows that at this moment there are also... 10 other people looking at the same service. Uh, and uh, this service is will soon be sold out. And this is all to, to get into your brain and to, to trigger your scarcity bias so that you will immediately buy because, oh, you, you, may, you may miss the boat and buying this product. So again, here, consumer protection laws need to be designed and enforced to make sure that companies do not do that and let you, the consumer, think about a product or a service to buy for a sufficient time and not play with your mind. And that is an important part of competition law and that that that, that I and, and many others came to realize over time that, that both need to go hand in hand in order for markets uh, to function well. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, Krishnan, you, you said um, just now uh, international law is more than an instrument. It's also a result from the encounter uh, with development. Um, and of course, there have been encounters and there have been attempts to reconstruct uh, the international economic order to serve uh, 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 developing countries uh, uh, better. Um, international law uh, produces and reproduces a certain type 
of, of development. Um, and that has, of course, also uh, invited resistance, uh, uh, especially because of human development being not served uh, uh, well enough. And I referred to that human misery earlier. Could you, could you um, reflect a bit on, on that, pick up uh, where you left off with that tension uh, between the two models of development, the two conceptions of development? Yes, um, I think a short genealogy would be helpful. Um, we have to remember human development, which uh, these days, you know, if you ask anyone what is development, they're more likely to say poverty alleviation or, you know, housing, or they'll pull off whatever they like from their long list of goals and SDGs and name that as their favorite definition of development. But, you know, human development emerged as a critique of the limits of economic development. In the 1970s, since the 1970s, a new paradigm of thinking and development emerged based on pre-existing work in welfare economics, public economics, as well as basic needs theory that attempted to explain why state-led development strategies had largely been disappointing and what else could take its place. That was seen to be the case, especially with uh, so-called ISI strategies, import substituting industrialization strategies pursued in Latin America, but also with status models of development in Asia, including in India. Um, the verdict was clear. The state did not deliver as promised, and its assumptions about economic growth, that it will trickle down, or that a so-called dual economy, um, the economy divided between urban and rural, will gradually disappear, etc., proved to be hard to defend. Human development was supposed to shift the focus not only to more microeconomic foundations, but also to human capability as a focus, particularly reflected in the work of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum and others. The focus was thus on poverty instead of growth, at least since 1972, when uh, you know uh, President Wolfenstein of the World Bank declared the so-called war on poverty, uh, and specific focus on sectors like housing, nutrition, and education. Fast forward to the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs in 2015, one can see the intellectual genealogy of human development, where it came from. As I said, human development is supposed to be a critique of the limits of economic development. However, it also rested on a critique of the state's role in the economy. But what human development revealed as a paradigm was that there was no escaping the state in the economy. To be successful, human development also demanded an activist state with the high capability in sectors like housing or health or education. If the state was involved in markets too much under previous development models like ISI, the state was equally expected to be involved in markets aggressively under human development models in areas like housing or ensuring food security and nutrition. At its core, the issue was the role of the state in the economy, and the move to human development did not cleanly break from economic development models, which also demanded state's involvement in the economy. The debate between economic development and human development, uh, Jan, is really about competing visions of the role of the state in the economy, which we are unable to really agree on. It, it, it plays out in country after country. International law, uh, in my view, has in fact had very little to do with human development, in my view. The core of mainstream international law has focused on building an architecture which will protect economic development of a particular kind, as you said, uh, especially a, taking a neoliberal turn since the 1980s. Uh, it was not always that way, but development certainly took a more neoliberal turn since the 1980s. It has had little space for human development. The main area of international law which has intersected with human development is the regime of, of course, human rights, especially economic and social rights, such as in the areas of housing, for example. It has also intersected with human development through demands by developing countries for norms such as the right to development. But those elements of international law remain marginal to the core of international law. Uh, for example, the way it is taught in American law schools or other law schools. Uh, or the way in which it is practiced by private practitioners or others, or the way in which it is actually used as a framework for interstate bargaining and negotiation. Uh, 
In fact, international law has acted more as a barrier to the achievement of human development rather than as an enabler of it. This goes back to what I said in response to the first question that you posed about the class character of international law, that it systematically favors the well-off. If you take health, for example, as a core human development goal, one can see the number of barriers that international law erects in achieving basic health equity across the world through intellectual property regimes, which protect pharmaceuticals and their pricing mechanisms, investment regimes, which prevent states from intervening in markets using threats of litigation and compulsory arbitration, and so on. While international law alone is not the reason for the move towards human development, as I said, the class character of the states which comprise the international system fatally undermines international law's ability to do so, and perhaps this is the call for reconceptualizing international law to move beyond that traditional framework of states. International law functions as a major barrier for the achievement of human development, even as it protects and promotes a particular version of economic development. C yes. Can, can I differ? <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I have to say that I do not agree. I, I think if you look at some of the most um, successful countries in the world uh, when it comes to combining what we could call the economic development regime and the human development regime, would probably be the Scandinavian or Nordic countries, uh, and I would uh, perhaps even include the Netherlands in, 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 in that category. No matter what uh, almost OECD uh, index for human development, be it inclusion, be it gender equality, be it participation uh, in the workforce, uh, no matter almost which social or human uh, index you look at, these countries always come out of top, on top. My, my very strong sense is that these countries come out of top because they have both embraced the economic development regime and the human development regime. These are countries that have absolutely 100% uh, uh, you know, internalized the idea of open markets. And contrary to what is sometimes the held belief here in the US, these are countries with very, very open markets, product markets, service markets, labor markets. But there's a very high degree, that's true on the other hand, of redistribution and a very strong state. So I think, I think I think it's more complex, to be honest. I think you need to you need to combine the human development side of things and the economic development side of things uh, to create uh, to create winners and 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 to to create social inclusion. Uh, that that would that would be my uh, take on this. Okay, can I just uh, briefly also yes. respond? Uh, I, I I mean I I, I agree uh, uh, entirely about the Scandinavian countries, but the real question is what has international law to do with their success? if it can be argued that the particular experiences and the success of Nordic countries resulted from the specific institutional designs and mechanisms and spaces created by international law, then of course, you know, I fully agree with you. Then the question becomes, if they could do it, why not other countries? But, you know, we are getting into the, perhaps the class character of societies, perhaps the way in which Nordic societies are structured and the way they relate to the states which actually govern them is quite distinct from, say, a country like Brazil with a history of slavery and racial exploitation and division and a particular form of capitalism which has been exploitative all along for the last 400 years, right? And, and, I, and, and I think perhaps also that, that, uh, that, that one source of disagreement between us is that we perhaps do not think of international law in the same terms. I'd think about perhaps the more abstract cooperation regimes that have been that have created transparency in product markets worldwide, the uh, the distribution distribution of the human rights regimes, uh, but also security alliances that have allowed these countries to grow and concentrate on developing a welfare state in relative safety from from war and so on. So I'm, I I am perhaps I would agree thinking about international law in the softest of, of, of ways, whereas you're perhaps thinking about uh, a, a more legally strict interpretation of what international law is. It's, it's, a, it's, half, it's, it's also a question perhaps to you if that might be the case. If it's a question, would you like to respond? Or I, I, I do think that the soft international law, I'm sorry, I, I do want to respond briefly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do think that the reference to soft international law that you made earlier uh, might be an indication of the way in which a counter regime or regimes of international law 
might actually try to uh, temper some of the excesses of a formal regime of international law, which doesn't really work for anyone other than the will of. And that's a clear cut conclusion. But perhaps the soft international law spaces could provide some examples, and I will come back to it later on. But I'm just thinking of the spaces in, for example, the organizations like the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, in the Committee on Food Security, uh, in um, soft law instruments like the 2012, you know, voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure in land, which actually provides a very practical and usable, you know, soft law standard at the international level for international organizations and states and NGOs and social movements to try to perhaps improve the situation of the most marginalized on the ground. So there are hopes within international law. It's not the whole thing is condemned, but... Uh, okay, poo. Yeah. <laughs> we have somehow to, to <laughs> see a future here. Uh, I, I was indeed planning to follow up with, uh, uh, and, and it, it is, fits nicely what you just said, uh, I was planning to follow up with the SDGs, right? We've been uh, uh, talking about development, but there's something like uh, sustainable development and the SDGs. But I'm going to hold our horses a little bit for a, a final uh, round. And uh, especially since, indeed, I want to open up the floor and the first gentleman um, is lining up. Would you please uh, mention your name and then uh, the question, please. Uh, hello, I'm Nicholas Rostow, and it's interesting that um, in many ways the most penetrating comments came from the non-lawyer on the panel, because uh, my question is, to what extent are you really talking about failures of governance uh, where human and economic development uh, lag behind? Were you talking about failures of an international legal regime which does not result from colonialism, but really uh, has its great historical impetus from the great wars among the great powers? Is it okay to pick up a few questions sure. and then uh, return to this side of the table? I think Professor Schrijver, I have a bit of the light. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nico Schrijver, uh, Leiden University, and I'm proud to add also a member of the curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law. Uh, so the question uh, put by the very interesting panel to us is, can international law be an effective instrument for development? And it raises also a bit the question, has there not been a neglect of the developmental dimension in the progressive development of international law in recent decades? Uh, what, what is left of Wolfgang Friedman's, of Oscar Schachter's, or Abi Saab's, or Bajawi's work on international cooperation for, for development? Um, for example, uh, we talk about the human rights approach to development, but the human rights to development itself in Western countries is a very controversial notion. We had preferential treatment, positive discrimination of developing countries in international trade or international investment law, but that is increasingly being eroded, replaced by graduation and integration, as we say. Transfer of technology, a very important notion for development purposes, but basically now replaced how to protect private intellectual property rights. And we have the OECD norm, 0.7 percent development assistance as a public duty, lip service only. So on the one hand, uh, of course, many people have been lifted out of poverty. That is fantastic. But we also have still more than 700 million people living under the poverty uh, boundary of less than $2 a day. We still have more than 40 least developed countries. 
So how to return to Wolfgang Friedman's um, um, uh, project of an effective international law of cooperation for, I would say, sustainable development and human development, not paying only attention to economic development, to migration, etc., but also really to genuine human development for, for the people who now suffer from a lot of social inequality. That is my question to this very interesting panel. Thank you for just uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, quite quite a question. Um, shall we uh, please? Uh, I recognize our friend from the Hague, the the, the um, uh, Chile ambassador to the Netherlands. Uh, we'll take uh, your question and then return to uh, to the table. It's just a, a very short question. Thank you very much for the panel. It has been very uh, enlightening and. and uh, uh, encouraging. Uh, two questions. It is there is a crisis on, on or not, maybe there's not uh, none uh, on governance. The question of world uh, governance and regional governance. Changes happening. Uh, changes being uh, put forward or or uh, proposed. And uh, the, the components of the governance, uh, which uh, uh, to some extent may be a, a legal. Uh, aspect or the question of having common interest or the growing or building on common interest. Two issues which are critical in Latin America, corruption and the second, the question of the lack of or not the lack or the political divide. And that's a very important question because you may have OECD, my country's a member of the organization, which uh, uh, is uh, proposing and putting a, a framework which is very useful to understand processes, but how to bring more actors in order to follow the same that approach, which is uh, uh, it, it will not uh, 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 be exempt of, of uh, controversies or clashes or conflicts, but corruption and the political development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask... Um you to just yeah answer the questions pick up on um uh, the one or, or uh, all aspects that you want to reflect on and but may i start with you this time okay. we go in a different order okay thankfully um, <laughs> those were difficult questions <laughs> uh all all great questions um just i just want to just briefly say something about poverty one of the biggest sort of advertisement for the idea that you know things are getting better is always the statistics constantly floated that the number of poor has fallen both in absolute numbers as well as as a proportion. But I must say that within academic community, there is no no consensus on this at all. A lot depends on how you actually define what is called the poverty line. And there is a lot of very critical work that has been done by economists. Um, including by Sanjay Reddy, for example, at the New School, which is actually raising some very profound questions about, well, where exactly you draw the poverty line will actually determine whether or not you can conclude that, for example, India's, uh, to take India as an example, the number of people below poverty line is 27.2% or uh, literally 77%. Okay. Now, all it takes is a little, you know, tweaking in the statistical modeling that is actually used, including the calculation of what is known as the baseline year. The baseline year based on which the so-called PPP numbers are actually calculated to decide if people have actually become better off. So I just want to put that on the table to say that the popular, there is a deep divide between here expert knowledge, which is deeply uncertain an increasing popular consensus, which makes us think that the world has gotten better because, hey, look at poverty numbers. But well, things are not as simple as that. And I, I do want to just say uh, briefly respond to uh, the question uh, from uh, Professor, uh, reflection from Professor Nico Schreiber um, about the development dimensions of international law, whatever happened to it uh, since uh, they were put on the table with such force including by his own work in the from the 
60s and 70s and of course during the 80s and i do want to say that uh, there is a particular way in which international law has been transformed aggressively for the worse since the 1980s and we have to actually begin to address the problems of international law by acknowledging that international law has gone off course in many ways and we have to actually at least bring it back to the aspirations and the goals that were shared by people like Oscar Schachter and Wolfgang Friedman and others who did place a lot more emphasis on the idea of international law being a law of cooperation and all that that implied. But having said that, I also think that we have to be not totally, you know, um, uh, we, we cannot be naive about uh, the, the, the fact that the class character of states as they engaged in this international law of cooperation in the 60s is totally different from the class character of the states we are talking about today. Just look at the developing countries, the way they participated in, in coalitions like G77. Not only has the coalition disintegrated as a political force, in fact, the class character of the states has changed so much internally that, as I said, even within developing countries, you have a small class of elites who actually do support for example, globalization, but as they understand it in their own interests, opposed by a large number of the social majorities that live in these states. And the issue is not as simple as left versus right there. It's not that, for example, you have a mirror image of, for example, the populist movements that exist in Europe or the United States, but there is still an equal amount of opposition to institutional structures such as the WTO. So we have to ask why. Well, I would like to see if I can perhaps address the three questions in reverse order, yeah. starting with the third question. Um, you, you, you talked about, I can't see you, yeah, you, you're there, um, talking about world governance, and then you mentioned uh, a concept um, that I haven't heard for, 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 for years almost. You mentioned the concept of common interest, and I was thinking maybe that's the problem. We don't hear too much about common interest anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly don't hear too much about common interests from the US. Sometimes we hear a little bit about it from the Chinese, but it's not common interest the way we would think about it, perhaps uh, in, in this part of the world. Uh, I, think, I think the Europeans are genuine multilateralists, but they're so preoccupied with their own problems, both institutional in the, in the European Union, but also the five or six biggest member countries that I mentioned so uh, earlier, that I'm not sure we can rely on EU to take the, the mantle of multilateralism into the future. Japan, perhaps, but are they strong enough? Is it then India? Is it Brazil? Is it South Africa? Some of these, Indonesia, some of these uh, 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 large uh, developing democracies uh, that we can count on. I think also for them it goes that they are not strong enough yet to take the mantle of multilateralism. So this is, this is a huge problem. We, 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 we do not have a big wave in support of world governance, in support of multilateralism at the moment. And, and, and I think this is really, really critical. And that, of course, also goes a long way in answering the, 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 the second and rather comprehensive uh, question about the lack of development in uh, international law over the last couple of decades. Part of the reason is, of course, this, this, this uh, nationalist, populist, protectionist uh, backlash. But if we look to the WTO, for example, we have not been able basically to create new rules since the formation of the WTO and the, f and the finalization of the Euro around in 1994. I was 25 at the time. I hadn't started my career in the foreign uh, service and nothing has happened. Uh, actually, there's a backlash now because uh, not only do we not create any up market uh, openings also in favor of developing countries, it was supposed to be the, the, the Doha development round. It hasn't, it hasn't concluded. And now we're actually seeing perhaps a crumbling also of the, the, the uh, dispute settlement system in the uh, WTO. So yes, there is certainly a lack of development in international law. I would, however, because time is running out, so maybe this is the time to say just yes. two words about the SDGs. Maybe the SDGs could be some sort of, uh, what's it called, um, silver lining. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I can certainly tell you that uh, in, 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 in my experience over the last couple of years since we agreed to the SDGs, this has become a brand of almost every government. Uh, and even in, in, uh, in, in, in parts of the developed world, SDGs is something that uh, companies are taking seriously, no longer just as sort of a branding exercise uh, that we need a little nice branding uh, opportunity here with the SDGs, but they're thinking about it in terms of the way they also do business when it comes to climate.
climate, water, uh, um, environment um, uh, solutions, uh, and, and, and so on. So I think there is a little bit of a ray of light when it comes to the SDGs. It's certainly the, 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 the boldest uh, and, and, and most brave uh, ambitions that mankind has ever set for, 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 for itself. And I think there is a little bit of, of, uh, of hope there. And then the first question was of failures of governance. Yes, of course, failures of governance pay a big, big, big part in, in all of this. Which countries succeed, which uh, don't. Um, and I'm proud to be working for an organization where what is at the core of what we do is actually to have our members and non-members come to the OECD and compare best practices. Maybe we should also have a year where we compared worst practices <laughs> uh, in order to, 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 to make sure that we, uh, that, 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 that we got rid of these failures of governance. But of course, that's a huge issue. And, 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 and this goes to the, to the heart of what we do at the OECD. We try to promote best practices uh, among countries, be it in, 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 in any uh, sector given. Thank you so much, yes. Uh, Martijn, could you uh, pick up on uh, the questions where you wish to and maybe also uh, pick up on the point of, of whether SDGs are uh, important uh, or there are other ways to improve uh, uh, the contributions of yep. your field yep. to development? No, I, I, I'm glad that, that maybe we can end a little bit the discussion on a high note rather than a very somber view on on the world uh, which which I also see I'm, I'm not I'm not blind for the problems but uh, I, I, I do uh, believe that uh, economic development is an enabler for human development and that uh, uh, com uh, economic laws international or domestic uh, really can help and stimulate economic development um, and and I see that there are many organizations around the, around the world, international organizations like uh, uh, Ulrich's organization, like the ICN, and like UNCTAD, who really make a difference in in helping countries to reach uh, and, and 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 promote economic development uh, uh, domestically. Um, and 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 I, I sometimes it's also good to just to look at some of the kind of the baby steps that have been taken by organizations because you know of course if you look at the big picture yeah you know, it's it's difficult it's slow it's it 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 is a not a quick fix but there are also you know the um, in, in if you look at the small steps there there is in there is progress and I think the SDG uh, uh, the, the, the shows the development goals of th that really helped a thinking uh, among companies uh, and among governments and agencies that enforce the law. I mean, over the past years, um, to give a few examples that are mainly in the in the competition field, the European Commission uh, uh, strictly enforced its rules against European truck manufacturers that entered into a quasi agreement, uh, not to introduce more environmentally friendly engines, uh, for a period of time. And this was typically an innovation cartel that was heavily punished by the European commission. There's also, uh, a, a cartel about used batteries where purchasers of used batteries uh, conspired to keep prices low, which led to, uh, to a lack of innovation in, the, uh, in, in recharging and, and uh, treating environmentally in an environmental friendly way of car batteries. And finally, a, a, an, a case that was also in, in, a, in various member states in Europe and outside uh, Europe, where uh, cosmetic producers of cosmetics agreed for a time being not to promote uh, and advertise with animal free testing. Uh, and that's also an agreement, that's also typically an agreement that, that restricted competition and where competition authorities intervene. So looking at these small baby steps together in the international cooperation within the bodies that, that, that and, and, and the structures that have, that were formed, uh, call it soft international law or international soft law, make me at least personally uh, hopeful uh, when we look at the future uh, and, and despite all the challenges that we face. Thank you. Indeed, we're running out of time. I don't see any questions left. Oh, one lady for a final, final question. Yeah, um, I kind of was sitting down and just grappling with 
trying to connect all the speakers. Yes. And as Martin was talking about consumers and the question of the way government is making rules to ensure that consumers have all the information. And I think as Bala Krishnan was talking about international law helping elites. And I think uh, Vestergaard was talking about the value of international law for everyone you know, a win-win, you know, balancing. I was just wondering in terms of consumers translating, because I'm also, I do a corporate and global governance, <laughs> translating the usage of consumers, because what I know as consumers to constituents, when we're talking about international law being used as an instrument of advancing human development, as Jan was saying, how do we address that disconnect? Because when you're talking international law, the institutions that govern and set the rules for international law are global institutions, be it, you know, you know, intergovernmental or whatever nature or WTO. How do you hold them accountable for human development at the grassroots when there's no, in terms of social contract? how do you pass on that information based on what you've done in terms of the competitive you know we're talking about com uh, competition rules yeah. now let's go into, into because that's mostly private right international law or whatever how do you uh, build those accountability systems within international law to ensure that the average person which is what i think balas krishna was talking about that disparity can hold them accountable because their governments are not really espousing yeah. their interests, assuming that yeah. that's not what's going on. Yeah. How do you connect in terms of what you were getting, perfect. Jan? Yeah, no, it's because a perfect the nature, final. The inherent structure of yes. international law is exactly. such that it's very difficult to achieve. Yes. So I don't, you know, but Thank that you. role you have, you know, what you were talking about in the dynamics of corporate, how do you feed that into constituents? you know, the political dynamics of state actors, you were talking non-state. This is what I'm talking about. It's an excellent, deep, it's, deep. it's a deep, indeed deep and excellent uh, uh, question. And also a perfect final question because it's also touches on where improvements should be made. I mean, how we can improve uh, the system and the structure and, and uh, a disconnect uh, that, that is there. So um, in that sense, uh, uh, a good, uh, uh, good, uh, uh, wonderful question to to finish on. Um, I'm sure we cannot address it fully, and I, I'm sure you understand it too. But maybe just very briefly, uh, please take it on board in your final statements because it's time uh, to hand over the podium. So, Martijn, the disconnect. Uh, do you have uh, at this point, or do you want to discuss it uh, during lunch? Uh, but feel free to give a brief response yeah, I, 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 in all honesty i need to think about it a little. <laughs> uh, uh, i don't have an answer ready maybe uh, okay uh, great but yeah. that's uh, yeah. that's uh, yeah. uh, something we yeah. we will keep talking about yeah. i'm afraid uh, for for many uh, years to come so thanks for that honesty because yeah. that in itself is also uh, very very valuable Bala, can you uh, wrap up um, uh, your the, the the final remarks that you wanted to make and and respond briefly to this important question? Sure. Actually, uh, responding to this question will help me simply summarize uh, what I wanted to say. Um, I, I do think that uh, I mean going forward, if international law is going to matter for development, perhaps we should. I mean, we can go about in one of you know, um, two different ways. One is that, well, we should reform the existing structures of international law, uh, which is, I think, a very legitimate goal to pursue, uh, including bringing back elements that have been lost to the mists of time, you know, from the 1960s and 70s and so on. Uh, law of cooperation, as I said. Uh, let's think creatively about how do you actually institutionalize something like that in international law. Uh, but also it means that perhaps we should think more creatively about moving away from a fixation on traditional categories of law, uh, 
sources of law, for example, in international law, of actors, your own work, for example, that actually we are disclosure <laughs> collaborating on on cities and international law as new sites where in areas like climate change you see cities taking the lead where nation states are failing to act perhaps that's a site of hope uh, for in new forms of international law making but also uh, the second thing i want to say is that i think we should probably start over expecting stop over expecting international law to deliver on everything. It's not the magic bullet. It's not going to solve all of the world's problems. And some problems are b resolved by other things which have no word international law in them. And that's OK. Uh, we don't have to get nervous because we think the international is becoming marginal or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just think of Kenya, for example, the most important one of the most important things to happen in Kenya in recent years is the building of a internet platform based on open source called Ushahidi. And Ushahidi helped Kenyan youth to mobilize in organizing how to hold their elected leaders accountable for their own promises. So if an elected leader says, look, I'm going to build a railway station, uh, uh, sorry, a, uh, a water uh, you know, a pump, uh, uh, there is really no mechanism or accountability for making sure that they actually deliver on the goods. But Kenyan youth actually built this platform with the technical collaboration of science faculty from Kenya, but also actually some of my colleagues at the MIT Media Lab to uh, build this platform. And that moment coincided with the moment of new constitution making in Kenya and the opening of new democratic reforms. And so the answers didn't exactly come for Kenya's problems from international law but it came from something else. I mean, that's okay. And, you know, uh, and so I, I, I do think that this kind of tells us that we, sh as I said earlier in response to one of your other questions, the bigger problem is that international has a lot of leftover barriers to development. Many of them fairly re of recent vintage from the 80s and 90s. And we need to work to actually try to bring them, cut them down to size. Thank you. Rory, the final moment right. off for you. Um, a very pessimistic answer to the final question and a somewhat more optimistic uh, final remarks. The, 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 the final question, um, I have to say, I think it's an important one and I think it's a complex one and deep one, as you said, but we're nowhere near there and not in the near term, not in the medium term. I mean, I would be very, very happy if we over the next five or, years, uh, five or ten years could have even states made responsible or accountable to what we are agreeing uh, at, at the multilateral level. Uh, so, so to think about how we make uh, uh, these uh, you know, international institutions directly accountable for citizens at the grassroots level, I think that's a very, very big ask given the circumstances we're in at the moment. So I'm very, very pessimistic on that one. And I, and I think it's, it's always also been very clear from the comments from the whole panel, including my own, that, that we do live in, in challenging times and, and, and I don't want to be uh, over optimistic, certainly, but, but let me just ask five very, very basic questions to human existence uh, when it comes to what we could call the golden age of international law and cooperation over the last seven decades, basically since the Second World War, be it in the form of the UN, the GATT, WTO, the OECD, NATO, EU, what have you. First of all, have we seen a rise in the amount of democracies around the world? Yes, we have. Have we seen a rise in the spread of human rights around the world over these seven decades? Yes, we have. Have we seen millions of bi and billions of boys and especially girls being lifted to new levels of education going to school? Yes, we have. Have we seen uh, uh, a decrease in the number of devastating wars around the world? The answer to that is also yes. Have we seen billions of people being lifted out of poverty over those seven decades? The answer is yes. So, I mean, Let's not leave this conference totally pessimistic about what mankind can achieve if we cooperate, if we reform our international law, if we reform our international uh, institutions. And my sixth question, and, and there might not be complete agreement in the panel on this, has international law helped this development? Has international law helped us being able to answer these questions with a sounding yes in 2019? Yes, it has. Thank you so much, Ulrich. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, uh, dear panelists, for this uh, discussion. We'll continue to discuss the topic 
Uh, and uh, it's my honor to give the floor back, so to speak, to our president, uh, Sean Murphy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jan. I want to thank the panel for an outstanding uh, intellectual buffet as a prelude to our actual buffet soon to come. Uh, and I also want to thank you, Jan, in particular, for moderating uh, the panel and very adeptly staying out of the crossfire that uh, broke out between Ulrich and Balakrishnan. So well done on that. It was friendly fire. <laughs> Um, I do want to say that since this is the last panel of the annual meeting, uh, not just my thanks to the audience for coming to this uh, particular panel, but to the entire conference, and it's probably a good opportunity to note that we do have the dates for next year's annual meeting. It's pretty much exactly one year from now, uh, April 1st to April 4th, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday to Saturday, also again here at the Washington Hilton. We'll be back in the same space. Um, so I think I'll just invite now uh, Saskia Brownes to come to the podium. She's the deputy mayor of The Hague uh, to say just a few closing remarks before we move on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, very good to be here. And uh, thank you, honorable guests of the panel for this uh, very interesting discussion you made and the big questions who are uh, are come uh, come to the surface um, on, in in this uh, this discussion uh, about globalization about uh, in, in in inequality about inequality in access to information what does that work how, how do new techniques have their influence on um, uh, on on our societies all over the world uh, what does that mean? And it raises the question about cooperation between countries, about what ha what um, um, governments has to do, multilateral agreements, yes or not? Do we have to set a, a set of rules in um, uh, using AI and using new techniques? Well, these all these are questions, and the answer is not that easy. We 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 heard that already, but I think this is the, the very um, uh, important question was our, uh, arised. I'd like to make some remarks about um, new techniques and international law as an instrument um, for uh, well-being. So I just have a, a fair few close to Mark and I'd like briefly to take you uh, back to the to the city of the famous legal scholar of the Nobel Prize winner, that is Tobias Asser. The city where I also live and the city where I work, the city of The Hague. Three months ago, we organized a hackathon, a competition for young, talented IT professionals to solve practical issues regarding peace and justice and security. Organizations like the Red Cross, the International Criminal Court and NATO submitted an issue to tech startups, which then got to work on these issues. And the winner of the competition produced something very valuable. They combined data from satellites and social media and created in this way a tool to make it easy to identify areas that are prone to land grabbing or land robbery. As you know, land grabbing is where big companies or political powers simply stated steal land. Usually this fertile land used by small local communities, land that is essential for their economic survival. In principle, these people are protected by international law. The law is an important instrument here to protect the development of communities. But that protection can only be effective if we also see where land is prone to land grabbing. And this is where the new practical instruments, in fact, using new technologies, can play an important role. Such as the tool created during this hackathon I mentioned. Because with such a practical tool, which reveals the risks, international law can, in, can turn, be better used as an instrument for protection and development as an instrument to work globally on the sustainable development goals, zero hunger, quality of education, good health, and overall well-being, and on equal economic opportunities. In other words, human development 
in the broadest sense of the world, in, of the word. As international city of peace and justice, The Hague is keen to contribute in development of international law as an instrument in broad development. In our city, many scholars and other experts have been working on the development of international law for over 100 years. And we also want to facilitate that development for the next age, the digital age. And that is why I mentioned the example just now. Because we can support the law with very practical digital solutions. And at the same time, it is important to properly embed our use of data and artificial intelligence in the current legal system. And there's a lot to be done to further develop international law. And The Hague feels it can play an important role in this regard. So I look forward to taking you back to The Hague, not just figuratively, as in my example, but also literally. For example, to attend in World Justice Forum in our city in four weeks' time. And for now, I warmly invite you to attend the closing reception, which you are hosting on behalf of the city of The Hague. And finally, I would like to thank our partners, Ernst Hirsch Berlin and Janne Neumann of the Asser Institute, our speakers of the panel, and of course, Mr. Murphy and Mr. Agrast of ASEL. And naturally, I look forward to meeting you up with you in the International City of Peace and Justice, and maybe next year here in Washington. Thank you very much. <laughs>